Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the economists and the organizers for uh, the kind invitations. It's always a great pleasure to be back to Saloniki, where I did part of my postgraduate studies more than 20 years ago. So uh, this, this event actually is taking uh, place in, in the summer of records, as uh, it was previously uh, said, and in reference to a recent statement by the UNDRR, uh, there were many unprecedented disasters and event uh, this year. Uh, most recent uh, uh, disaster was in Libya, where more than 5,200 people were killed uh, by floods, and currently there are more than uh, 1,100,000 ,000 missing people still uh, uh, until this moment. So, um, uh, behind every record-breaking uh, uh, rainfall, uh, uh, temperatures, wildfires, uh, there are severely affected communities uh, struggling with food scarcity, uh, displacement, economic and environmental damages. It is an escalating global crisis indeed. Um, there are destruction of home infrastructures, uh, scarce resources, disrupted economies, and reduced access to even very basic services. And this, in turn, creates what's called a domino effect. So one problem leading to another, one disaster leading to another. So it's not about a standalone disaster leading to people move and uh, being displaced to other places. It's that domino effect, which also we experienced that in uh, Lebanon, and I'm going to reflect that uh, later on. So, uh, and in this context, we're now very often hearing uh, the, the word climate security. This is a term that we have started to hear very often and more in 2023, especially after uh, the year 2022, where the world experienced uh, both one of the warmest years on record and the highest number of violent conflict since the inception of the United Nations. Uh, so according to the latest IPCC uh, report, approximately 3.6 billion people already live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change. And that's really a big uh, number. And uh, in the future, by 2030, it's going to even to get uh, worse. So some of the common uh, climate-induced uh, risks uh, to peace and security, mainly competition over limited uh, resources. So in 2022, nearly 260 million people in around 60 countries faced acute food insecurity, and uh, more millions of people faced starvation, around 35 million uh, people. Uh, and in countries affected by conflict and uh, fragility, the impact is even worse and is amplified. Uh, mass displacement also by, two, uh, by 2050, actually, climate change could force 216 million people to uh, move within their own countries. Uh, water scarcity, low crop pro productivity, and rising sea levels will be kind of, will shape the trajectory of uh, displacement and relocations for the next half century and speeding forced displacement while worsening existing tensions and creating even uh, new ones. And as, as people move uh, and they are displaced, they often cross uh, international boundaries and this presents another challenge uh, for both actually migrant, uh, the environmental refugees and hosting uh, nations. And the influx of displaced uh, a population can strain resources, challenge social cohesions, and necessitate international cooperation. So how we can help, how uh, the situation can be uh, made uh, less intense? Uh, definitely responses to climate change should align with conflict prevention and peace building uh, actions. Uh, again, in reference to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, uh, it recognizes that climate solution can offer um, what we call new avenues to build peace in conflict-prone regions that are vulnerable to climate change. Even addressing climate change or climate-induced risk uh, uh, to peace and security requires a holistic approach. And uh, we have seen that this should rely on collaboration between the climate and environmental fields and know-how on one hand, 
and uh, the peace and security ones on the other. And this is very challenging, believe me, because we have been facing that and experiencing that for the past uh, at least 10 years. Uh, coordinating such efforts is challenging, and there are many other uh, challenges. Also in solutions and ways to help, we need definitely to work on adaptation and mitigation, and this is another topic now of, of discussion, and we count much on the upcoming COP28, which will, be, which will take place in the, in the Emirates, uh, where actually we look on how commitments will be translated into actions on the ground. Uh, but I would like also to highlight more the issue of humanitarian aid and assistance and financial uh, matters that are needed, which remain very disconnected and in insufficient to meet uh, the needs. Uh, again, if I want to refer to a very recent study conducted by UNDP, it shows how between 2014 and 2021, extremely fragile states received only 2.1 US dollars per person in multilateral climate finance compared to $161 per person for non-fragile states. Uh, so the shift is, is very big. There must be an increase in international aid specifically to the most fragile uh, states. And of course, investing in innovative solutions and climate resilient infrastructure. I want to refer back to my colleague. He talked also just to give some examples on uh, concrete examples on the uh, underscoring actually the intricate relationship between natural disasters, conflict, and migrations in the Mediterranean, specifically in the region, Lebanon, uh, Syria. If we take the example of the Syrian war and conflict uh, induced uh, migrations, it's not solely caused by uh, a, a natural disaster. Uh, so the, on the ongoing conflict, still until uh, present, has resulted in a significant displac displacement of people. The conflict was fueled in part, and again, I repeat, in part, uh, by a prolonged drought that led to the displacement of rural populations uh, to move to urban area, uh, straining resources and exacerbating the uh, tensions in these uh, cities. And this conflict-induced migrations has led millions of Syrians to seek refuge in neighboring Mediterranean countries, including Lebanon, where the country hosted uh, around 2 million refugees for a small country like Lebanon, uh, with 500 million, 600 million uh, uh, citizens, you can imagine almost half of the population now is uh, refugees uh, with very limited resources. This in turn creates tension in the country and that's actually what we have been trying to study and assess. And we did a lot of modeling, a lot of studies at the watershed level uh, because that's the unit where we can do very good uh, assessment, vulnerability assessment, actually, where we measured exposure, uh, uh, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, because that's the key word. And it, we were able to model hotspot uh, areas that actually have been subject to uh, uh, increased tensions, increased internal conflicts, and local uh, to national uh, displacement. And these were the areas, actually, where we have uh, uh, large number of refugees where we start seeing unprecedented natural disasters like, uh, uh, like fires, floods, land degradations, uh, outbreaks of pests and diseases and, and, and forests because of all these changing environmental conditions. In 2020, it was the first time we see forest fires burning in cedar forest above 2,000 meters above sea level. These areas have never experienced fire in, in their history. So uh, the situation is very crucial, and when we projected this condition in the future, it turned to be very uh, dramatic uh, quantitatively. Uh, just I want to say that uh, um, adaptive capacity is key in solving a lot of problems, and we can work on that in order to reduce the impact of climate or climate-related disasters on very vulnerable communities. Thanks.